Well, anyways, thank, first I'd like to thank um, the organizers, Queen's College, the Canadian Forces, and Air Canada for the beautiful trip up here. Um, my name is Andrew Herr. I'm the CEO of Helicase. Um, we work with individuals, Fortune 500 CEOs, special operators, companies, um, to enhance performance, and we develop technology to further that. I always like to start with these two quotes um, from science fiction authors. Arthur Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And Gibson said, the future's already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And when I synthesize these two quotes, my takeaway is there are already magicians amongst us, and we need to think about how we can use that magic to achieve our missions better. So I think it's always useful to say, you know, to step back and what are we talking about? We're on the physical panel, but real world performance happens at the crux of physical, social, and cognitive performance. Um, and not only is this a Venn diagram that they overlap, but there should be arrows because these drive each other. If you're at your physical limit, you're degrading your cognitive performance. If you're at your cognitive limit, you're degrading your physical and social performance. So there's a huge inner reaction here, and I think whenever we try to enhance one or the other, we need to think about, obviously, the human as a whole. I also think that while there seems to be quite good agreement in this room, and I'm very strongly in support of it, that this is an important topic, if we look at the fact that the US military doesn't have a, a PEO human enhancement, doesn't have a group dedicated to purchasing these solutions, it tells you that there are a lot of people who, if we define care about as we'll take action because of, don't care that much about this. And so we need to make a strong case for why this matters. Um, and the best experiment of warfare, as best I can tell, ever accidentally conducted was in the Vietnam in the air campaign. From 1967 to 1969, we had about 100 kills against North Vietnamese aircraft um, between the US Air Force and the US Navy. And we had a two to one exchange ratio, meaning we were shooting down two of their aircraft for every one we were losing. And while that was an advantage, it was much worse than we expected. We expected to have a huge advantage. And so both the services go back to the drawing board. And the Air Force says, the missiles aren't tracking properly. This is the start of the missile age. In fact, the F-4 fighter that they're both flying is the first ever fighter without an internal gun. And the Navy goes back to the drawing board and says, the missiles aren't tracking properly. But partway through that study, they say, actually, the problem is our pilots don't know how to use the missiles. We had previously had very um, forward-thinking, dedicated air combat training, but we'd scrapped it because the missiles were going to take away the need for human performance. So this is the genesis of Top Gun. They bring it back. They have a year while we stop conducting combat missions over North Vietnam during negotiations, 69 to 70. And from 1970 to 1973, we have another 100 air combat kills on the US side. The Air Force fixes the missiles and stays at a two to one exchange ratio. And the Navy fixes the humans and enhances their performance. And they go to 12 to one. So in a real combat environment against thinking, adapting adversaries, Enhancing human performance can give you almost an order of magnitude improvement in tactical outcomes. I also think we need to answer what's changed. Um, and by that I mean people have been telling you, myself included, over the last 20 years, that this field is going to be transformational, revolutionary, and it hasn't delivered. And so if I can't tell you that something's changed today, then you probably shouldn't believe me once again. But I think the good news is that we have a very clear story about what's changed. First, a ton of money has flowed into this field. So Editas Medicine raises $120 million to advance genome editing. Companies like Apple are bringing in human performance sensors that are helping us understand better. Many billions of dollars every year are being spent on this. Supplements alone are something like a $60 billion industry. The second is um, we have a lot more science. It turns out we now have a good reason to understand why when we sequenced the human genome, we didn't understand why some people were smart and others weren't, or why people were tall, or why people were um, good or bad at golf. And the answer is one mechanism there is, is something raised earlier called epigenetics. And literally, if you don't have a chemical modification on your DNA, it's wrapped up in this spindle-like protein, and you can't make that protein. And so we have learned a lot about the science of how the human body works, and we have new tools. Um, so the genome sequencing cost has fallen um, from 100 million or almost a billion dollars at the start to essentially $1,000 a genome today. So to take that as many orders of magnitude as you'd like. And it's actually improved faster than Moore's law did with computing. 
I don't think I get to give a talk without showing a CRISPR slide, right? So we have new tools to understand, interrogate, and modify humans. Uh, and so where may all this be going before I actually talk about what I'm supposed to be, which is um, how this matters for armies and the military. If you take microprocessors and computing um, as a backdrop, what's really interesting is we all know that technology development is nonlinear. It's almost a trope today. But in the first 20 years from the 70s to the 90s, you only had about a thousand times improvement in transistor counter speed in microprocessors. And essentially, it didn't change that much in society. We could send a man to the moon and a missile to the Soviet Union before all that thousand times improvement. Um, and so it didn't change things radically. And, but you only had another thousand times improvement from the 90s to the 2010s. But of course, it changed the world. In society, we had the internet. Now we have social media, smartphones. And of course, in the military, you had radical advances in C4ISR um, and the precision strike revolution. Um, that led many to open their eyes after the first Gulf War and say, wow, the U.S. Is, and our allies are way ahead. So if you take those two 20-year divides, we can see that not only is technology development nonlinear, but impact is nonlinear. And I think that's an important lesson for where we are today. Because although biology is much more complex than computing, we now have computers to help. And I think we're on a similar 40-year cycle. And if you put from the end of the Human Genome Project in 2003, the first sequencing of a human genome. We're not even 20 years into that, and yet we're already starting to see the, sim the signals that there's a liftoff. So I think if we put ourselves on that, then I've now publicly actually wagered, in addition to um, proposed, that I think you'll see at least 500 million human genomes edited uh, in less than 20 years, um, and more impact from this field than the internet by 2040. The key thing, though, is so what? If I can improve somebody's physical or cognitive capacity, how does that translate to effectiveness on the battlefield? So I think it's always valuable to bring up that these two pictures are fairly similar in that they're both tanks, they're both from World War II, um, and they're both about similarly effective. The difference is the first tank is a German tank, and the second tank is a French tank, and of course we know what happened. But the interesting part of that story is the French had tanks and radios and airplanes, and they split them up one tank per unit as a mobile artillery and used them the same way that they'd used technology before, or they'd operated the same way using that technology. And the Germans formed armor units and used them to strike through into the rear areas of the French. They used radios to communicate with those forward forces and to coordinate with the planes, which were mobile artillery. And of course, the Germans were in Paris in three weeks. So technologies are not revolutionary, but technologies plus new concepts of operations and new organizational structures can give you radical enhancements in military capabilities. Um, so where might we see these from human enhancement? I like to think about this future environment as um, undergirded by complexity of the task and, task and environment. Here you can see on the vertical or the y-axis and the duration of the task on the x-axis because humans are only really good under the bubble, or what we call the inverted U. Because at a sufficiently short time point, at microseconds, a human just can't respond, so you're gonna need autonomy and other systems to help us. And at very long time scales, either our endurance ends, or, of course, having a lot of humans working for a long time is very expensive. But we're incredibly good in the minutes to hours to days time frame at extraordinary complexity. And I'll propose to you that even having worked on artificial intelligence and other things, that these systems are nowhere near where humans can operate. Um, and many times we'll team them together using the human capabilities, um, human cognitive capabilities, as well as our moral ethical judgment. So humans are gonna stay. So we need to think, where might we be able to enhance our humans in this most critical area? Because our capability at the end of the day is gonna be about humans times technology. The first I would say is, what if everyone could perform like our special operators? Um, and my takeaway here is a couple things. One, if we just improve the performance and keep our units structured the same way and operate the same way, sure, they'd be a bit better. But if you take the regular forces, make ten smaller units, more freedom, swarming tactics, you might actually see that 10x improvement in performance that you really want. 
And so do we have any idea that you could get the average person to this soft level of performance? And the answer is absolutely. I can tell you two physiological markers, the ratio of which predicts 30% of soft performance in individuals versus regular people. I can tell you that in a study we just ran with over 300 army cadets, in eight weeks, I can use performance nutraceuticals to decrease their two mile runtime by 30 seconds, I can improve their mood by 60% and their sleep by 40%. And that's only in eight weeks. What if age and injury didn't slow you down? What if you had people who were at the peak of that technical knowledge that we saw earlier in that slide, but also at peak physical capacity? This would probably force you, if you were to take advantage of this optimally, to change the up and out system. You would change the way you use your personnel. Um, and overall, you might be able to have substantially more knowledge and experience at the tip of the spear, as well as individuals serving longer and longer that would be a radical change in effectiveness. And while it's hard to see, these are wounded warriors playing basketball from wheelchairs. What if life cycle costs fell dramatically? In the US, if you add our medical budget in the Department of Defense plus our Veterans Affairs budget, it's more than a third as big as our Department of Defense budget. So what if you suddenly had the same capability at 70 cents on the dollar or a third more capability and you didn't have as many problems with people getting out hurt um, and having to rehabilitate them in society. I think suddenly, again, you might have substantially more effectiveness. So my question is always, how do we win this future? Good news, people here from the Boston area, others, um, US universities, collaboration with our allies, Canadian universities, we are clearly in the lead scientifically. The bad news is we are not taking advantage of it. This is a real menu from a real US Army base, and it's an embarrassment. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody, regardless of your nutrition philosophy, who thinks this is the optimal answer. So going back to the comment I made earlier, which is if we talk about caring about as taking action because of, then people in the US military don't care about human performance. But we have to be involved. Why? What you can see here is um, if you look at the baseline physiological stress hormone levels, obviously they're elevated during a skydive or even a public speaking test. They're nowhere near a combat simulation like Army Survive, Evade, Resist, Escape School. And they're almost all the way up there with open heart surgery. And oh, by the way, combat is hundreds or thousands of times longer temporally than these other factors. So our environment's different, as we heard very nicely earlier. Our physiological and performance environments are different. That means we need unique solutions and we're gonna to need to play a role. Second, performance is deeply in medicine's shadow. You hear doctors that wanna do no harm, which from their standpoint, because most medicines have severe side effects, if you're not broken, we're not gonna do anything. But we have an enormous opportunity to enhance beyond just broken. Um, but you're gonna to have to separate it from the medical community. It's gonna to have to be its own R&D community and you're gonna need your own PEO or own PM program manager for these kinds of things. Third, here's the good news. Enhancement can be done ethically. When we went down to the military college where we ran our study, we had a full informed consent. None of their commanders were in the room. And I can tell you that hundreds of students consented into our study in a short period of time because we told them we were gonna enhance their performance. This is data from the US Army more broadly showing that over 50% of soldiers take supplements today. And I think the unethical thing is despite very good science, the US Army doesn't tell them at all that most of what they're taking doesn't hurt them or is wasting their money. There are 102 General Nutrition Center supplement stores on US military bases as of a few years ago. And so we allow them to come on base and sell things to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and yet we don't give them the knowledge about how to use these things effectively. Oh, and by the way, see that bar in green where there are more people who use five or more supplements a week than use even two to four? That means you have a super user group, and if you've ever been to the gym on these bases, you know who they are. Um, so people want to take part in this. They understand. And they understand also that if they're going into combat, it's not like no risk versus doing something. They know that if we enhance their performance, it might save their lives. And it might allow our, our country, our countries, to succeed in missions of national importance. So here are my five principles for aggressive R&D. Um, you actually need three types of R&D. 
The first one you need is understanding the relationship between performance and physiology. So you can have good metrics. You obviously want to understand the basal, how do these things work, how do humans work? But I think because we're dealing with complex adaptive systems, one human body is a complex adaptive system, many humans are even more so. What we've learned from many years of study is that to learn something about the system, you have to poke it. And so if we can start running research where we take well-founded approaches to enhancing performance and try them, and I'm not saying try one pill because the signal to noise ratio is never gonna work. Use integrated interventions, what you can find is radical enhancements in performance. And you have to do this in large subject groups with humans. It turns out sadly that mice aren't humans or happily, I don't know. Um, because if we want to know what it is, and it doesn't have to just be humans, it needs to be our military personnel because we need to know it's a representative group. They need to be done well, randomized, placebo controlled to make sure these things really do what they're saying because we should spend money on them if they do and we shouldn't if they don't. It has to be done in realistic environments because if I can enhance you in a lab and that doesn't work in the battlefield, then that's not only not helping me, it's taking money away from something that can. Um, and always we need meaningful endpoints. What do you actually care about? If I can change something in your blood, but it doesn't end up with a bridge built quicker, um, then that's not gonna help our forces. So my last point is we have to be aggressive in our pursuit of ethical enhancement. And there are many opportunities to do that. Our military personnel are demanding this, um, and I think there's a huge opportunity to help them. Thank you.